And, and Amy, every week at least we get a new instance of uh, some teacher thinking it's uh, intelligent to go on social media and preach about their leftism. The American flag makes me uncomfortable. I've got 180 days to turn these kids into Antifa quality Marxists and so on and so forth. Uh, we talk a lot about the indoctrination camps that K through 12 school systems have turned into uh, K through 12 school systems on the government side and so many private schools, so many elite private schools, so many Catholic schools. The, the conversation about Bennett Academy even earlier in the morning. Uh, so there's, uh, I guess, two approaches. One is you can try to go send your kid to a school, school system, college that doesn't indoctrinate, that's interested in sort of the classic small L liberal education and wants a free marketplace of ideas, robust discussion, debate, contemplation. Uh, or you can try to disinfect, undoctrinate, if you will, the school that your kids are going to. Uh, well, he, here's one example, by the way, of uh, another place. I just love the marketing campaign. I think we've played this before, but uh, yeah, bears are revisiting. New St. Andrews College, which is in Moscow, Idaho, which has been around for like 25 years, and it only has like 150 students. Yeah. But I guess it's an Division college. Division four? Yeah. <laughs> or uh, Division five, sorry. Yeah. Division, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, what is it? It's a college in, in Idaho uh, whose cr curriculum is modeled, at least in part, on the actual Harvard of the 17th century. Wow. When Harvard used to educate uh, and enlighten, you know, all those Ivy League schools that are divinity, that were founded as divinity schools that are now uh, institutions of secular humanism. But uh, listen to this marketing campaign. I, I, I would think that this would have greater appeal Maybe not, be, maybe because it's in Moscow, I had a small college and so on and so forth. But, you know, this approach to marketing to parents at, from pre-K through post-secondary would have appeal these days, at least to some. American colleges have become more hostile to the faith of young Christians than the beaches of Normandy were to the Allies, literally. Undergraduate training wasn't always a death trap of unbelief. Once colleges were boot camps for body, mind and soul. Now, most college students spend their days in tax-funded adult daycares with all the intellectual rigor of lazy rivers, safe spaces, and complimentary condoms. And in our recent COVID faux apocalypse, those daycares became prisons almost overnight. Cover your face, line up for your shot, stay in your room, but don't worry, the condoms were still complimentary. At New St. Andrews, awesome. you are not on yeah. vacation, you are not in daycare, and you won't be herded into a dorm. From week one, you'll be treated like an adult. You're responsible for paying your own rent and developing your own grocery budget. Or going hungry. Get a shot, or don't. Mask up, or don't. Most of our students even work part-time jobs on top of the 40-hour class workload. It's part of the anti-fragile hustle and grind that distinguishes our graduates from the majority of their own generation and that employers and graduate schools love. Most college graduates in the U.S. are stuck paying off loans for years. New St. Andrews sets you up to graduate debt-free and dangerous, wow. ready to pursue grad school, a family, or business opportunities in the real world without any reliance on pork subsidies from Mother America and with no weepy need for safe spaces. The real world isn't a cushy place. No one owes you success. You are entitled to exactly jack squat in this life. But rich or poor, unlike your face or your freedom, your job or your business, an education and the ability to think clearly can never be taken from you as long as you are still above ground. Not by petty tyrants or cowardly clergy, not by thoughtless mobs or lab coat megalomaniacs. At New St. Andrews College, you'll learn from teachers whose ideas equipped men and women to build Western civilization in the first place, and which will be used again to defend and rebuild what has been lost as the West has faltered into decay, losing her faith and her mind. Uh, well... The culture on campus uh, migrated down to K through 12, migrated over to K through 12 private schools. Uh, it also expanded outward into corporate America. Maybe there are some examples like uh, I don't know St. Andrews, but the, you know Hillsdale, some of the other colleges we've talked to that can provide examples for classical Christian education and other just 
classical education, non-denominational, uh, inspire more private schools, even K through 12 school systems to adopt classical education as well to maybe some colleges can unwind what the colleges have wrought. Maybe, maybe not. For more on this topic, we're pleased to be joined by Bonnie Kerrigan Snyder. She's director of high school outreach at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Her new book, Undoctrinated. Bonnie Snyder, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. That's an amazing ad for New St. Andrews College. I think I want to go there myself. I don't know. I th- yeah, <laughs> exactly. Look, I'm looking at the, our website right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I'll go back and at least audit some classes, uh, if nothing else, at this yeah. stage for me. But, um, yeah, so so what about that, you know, undoctrinated, I'll just jump right in here, is one of the ways to undoctrinate for some schools at whatever level to provide a model for others to replicate and or scale? You mean that they should follow what New St. Andrews College is doing? That would be a wonderful idea if they would. I'm beginning to wonder about the teacher training that is happening in schools. I I was trained through alternate routes, and uh, I learned that there are ethics that guide the practice of teaching, and what's going on in these schools is definitely unethical uh, when you're talking about teachers who are not allowing free thought or um, free discourse in their classrooms. That's not how it's supposed to be conducted. Well, then how do we undoctrinate our children? What's the process? Well, I I offer a lot of recommendations in the book. And, you know, one of them is to insist on total transparency. There's been a lot of concealment of aims. We're seeing actual contempt uh, for parents. It used to be very collaborative between parents and teachers. You used to sort of hand off and expect that teachers were going to act in loco parentis. So we are seeing more parental involvement. That's going to have to continue. Uh, But I think you're also going to now have to inoculate kids. You know, we talk a lot about vaccination these days. And uh, parents are going to have to learn enough about the new theories that are are finding their way throughout education to be able to explain to their kids the philosophical underpinnings, where these ideas are coming from. Uh, And you're going to have to debrief your kids after school, and you're going to have to supplement. Uh, to, you know, counteract what's happening in the classroom. Not all teachers are doing this. Uh, we do here at FIRE when nonpartisan uh, and teachers come to us who are very concerned that they are uncomfortable with what's going on, but they also are feeling the pressure to keep quiet. Well, and uh, you're going to need to have counsel on retainer, too. I mean, you talk about transparency and, you know, doing things like foying the school district if you can't get uh, cooperation short of... Uh, short of leaning on the law. And then uh, that woman, uh, that uh, mom in Rhode Island gets sued by the teachers union for seeking public records from the school. Yeah. And uh, the teachers unions, uh, unfortunately have very, very deep pockets. And yet ironically, if you go to the NEA's own website, they have a code of ethics for educators that is very articulate and well-written. And it affirms that teachers will not unreasonably restrict students' access to competing views in the classroom. And if only they would enforce their own code of ethics, we would be in a much better place than, than we are right now. Well, right, but that's all for show. I mean, the, the real play is the real play. I mean, you were a teacher. Yeah. And so, I mean, w- what's your sense of what's happening in the profession and in the classroom? Is it just being overrun by ideologues? Or is it uh, is it people that, still majority people who are, trying to instill a love of learning into children, but have to deal with teachers union and administrators that are ideologues. I mean, what, what's the dynamic going on in most of these schools where we see, you know, bad actors and bad and that serve as bad examples? I think that there is a small group of bad actors who are still not the majority, but they are so fervent and so zealous in their pursuit of what they believe is righteous action, that nothing will dissuade them. Uh, I think we have a cowed majority who are allowing uh, things to happen that they should be standing up against. I think that we have too many teachers who are silently in opposition to this but aren't willing to speak up. Uh, I don't think the, the, the bad actors are the majority yet, but they certainly have taken over the culture because of the complacency of the majority. Uh, but uh, I'm going to remain optimistic that I think you know a few are incorrigible, a few will have to be weeded out. I think some of them can be taught better. 
uh, as they mature. We're, we're also seeing, you know, demographically a sort of a bubble. The, the millennials were sort of a boom lit off of the children of the baby boom, and people in their 20s tend to be radical sort of by nature. It's a radical age. Uh, there's this idea of called edge work that, you know, there's a reason why people in their 20s are the ones who fall off of, you know, rock climbing mountains and things is because they tend to like to do extreme things. And, uh, you know, some of these teachers will mature out of it and they're going to gain and grow in wisdom. Uh, but some of them are, are incorrigible and will have to be corrected or removed. Have you talked to any or spoken with, excuse me, any liberal parents and how they feel about this? Yeah, we do at FIRE hear from, I would say, you know, center-left people who are even more horrified by what's going on. I, I think a lot of people on the right are, I hate to say, used to this, but it doesn't really shock them because they're, too, you know, they've been tuned into this for longer, uh, whereas it is now reaching a level that people on the left are suddenly being shocked, and uh, and they are more... Uh, amazed and uh, nonplussed by what's going on than even people on the right. And they, they are very helpful allies uh, to have in this fight because they have the credibility that, you know, conservatives can be very easily dismissed by those, by people on the left, by radicals, but when even small L liberals or, or, or just, you know, people who consider themselves on the, on the left side of the political spectrum, when they've had enough, then I think, you know, it, it's even starting to show up in, the New York Times and papers that we never thought would address this issue. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I was having this conversation with a friend about the the likes of a Jonathan Haidt. He, uh, to me, is sort of the sort of the the reasonable center left person, or at least that's the presentation. And we've had him on the show. I, I you know, I, I appreciate that he's a, a a thoughtful intellectual type and all that. Okay, but he's also to me a bit of a useful idiot for the radical left. You know, uh, there was this Wall Street Journal series last week on on, so, on Facebook in particular and uh, and how hypocrit- hypocritical it is, how they have uh, guilty knowledge of the impact of Instagram on the mental health of teenage girls and so on and so forth. They're not doing the things they say they're doing about it. And one of the people that uh, pilgrimage to see Zuckerberg at his request was Jonathan Haidt from NYU, this, you know, psychologist, mm-hmm. psych, 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 uh, whatever, he's a psychology professor. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, he's like he's because he's the reasonable guy that can give Mark Zuckerberg the stamp of, hey, um, you know, he's a free speech guy. He's a uh, you know, guy that's a, a little uh, jumpy about censorship. And and um, he's a pro free marketplace of ideas guy, but he's of the center left. So he'll have credibility with uh, the elites in my circles. And uh, so we need his stamp of approval. So he fly, you know, he flies out and so on and so forth. And and then uh, hey, Hyde uh, comes away is basically saying, yeah, I don't know that Zuckerberg is really serious about the things that he says in congressional testimony about uh, monitoring the um, content decisions of Facebook. But 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 Hyde is never going to take up the fight. He's sort of an an arbiter. He's sort of a sideline guy. Uh, He's uh, going to write an op-ed. He'll he'll have a conversation with Zuckerberg, but he is never going to risk sort of status. He is never going to ascribe bad motivations to people who have bad motivations. And I just think that so many on the center left and center right have no real appreciation for the depths of what is happening and why it's happening. They have no ability to ascribe bad motivations because they're actually really not spoiling for the fight. They're just saying, you know, here's where I think reasonable, the reasonable position is, but I'm not really going to do anything in furtherance of it. So if you want to steamroll over me, like you steamroll over conservatives who are easily marginalized, as you say, well, then you go right ahead. I'm not going to be much harm. It's an interesting question of whether or not the solutions are going to come. It's unlikely, I think, that the solutions are going to come from inside the academy, which, you know, obviously Jonathan is uh, within the academy as a professor. And the ed schools are another, you know, place where so many of these problems have festered for so many decades. I would would, uh, say it goes back as far as the 1930s. There's been you know, presumably this long march through the institution of these ideologies taking over um, or, you know, organization, you know, it's in the churches, it's in 
Uh, it's obviously in government. It's in the schools. It's in the colleges. Uh, so this is a battle. I don't think there's going to be a, a savior that's going to come along, a, a public figure who's going to correct this. This battle is going to be fought in every household. It's coming, you know, to your front door, and uh, every family is going to have to fight it. I think that that's where we're going to find the heroes. And, and so it, let, let's take a, a real world case study. Let's say, like uh, we were talking about earlier in the show. So let's say Grace Church School in um, New York City, and Paul Rossi, the math teacher, that was bounced uh, from there because he didn't want to treat his kids differently based on their race and his math class of all things. Um, so if I'm a parent uh, with a kid at Grace Church and I'm paying 60 grand a year to send my kid to Grace Church and I see that happen to Paul Rossi, what should I do? Well, I, I think people need to vote with their feet. I think that, you know, we, we hear from very, very frustrated private school parents. So many people think they can buy their way out of this problem. But in reality, you may be going from, you know, uh, from the kettle, what is it, from the fi- frying pan to into the fire, if you try to do that. Uh, so, uh, Paul Rossi, I think maybe you want to hire him as your personal child tutor at this point. He may be available freelance, you know. Uh, I think that there are homeschooling pods that are being formed. I think that, uh, personally, I would like to see hybrid schooling models develop where you send your kid to school for the subjects that you think are valuable and you homeschool them to the things that you're you feel confident covering uh what what we're currently doing isn't working and we're going to have to uh, to use the popular phrase disrupt this system because it is uh it has broken down she is bonnie kerrigan snyder she's the director of high school outreach at the foundation for individual rights and education fire the new book she wrote undoctrinated pick it up thanks so much for joining us bonnie snyder appreciate it My pleasure. Thanks for your interest in this topic. Thank you. And she joined us on our turnkey.proanswer line.